This is day 14 of reading Revelation. I heard a loud voice speaking from the temples to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's fury upon the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. Festering and ugly sores broke out on those who had the mark of the beast or worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. The sea turned to blood like that of a corpse. Every creature living in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water. These also turned to blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just, O holy one, who are and who were in passing this sentence. For they have shed the blood of the holy ones and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Then I heard the altar cry out, Yes, Lord God Almighty, your judgments are true and just. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. It was given the power to burn people with fire. People were burned by the scorching heat and blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues, but they did not repent or give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Its kingdom was plunged into darkness, and people bit their tongues in pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, but they did not repent of their works. The sixth angel emptied his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These were demonic spirits who performed signs. They went out to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for the battle on the great day of the Lord God Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who watches and keeps his clothes ready, so that he may not go naked and people see him exposed. They then assembled the kings in the place that is called Armageddon in Hebrew. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. A loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. Then there were lightning flashes, rumblings, and peals of thunder, and a great earthquake. It was such a violent earthquake that there has never been one like it since the human race began on earth. The great city was split into three parts, and the Gentile cities fell. But God remembered great Babylon, giving it the cup filled with the wine of his fury and wrath. Every island fled, and mountains disappeared. Large hailstones, like huge weights, came down from the sky on people, and they blasphemed God for the plague of hail, because this plague was so severe. I'm beginning to suspect that you are tiring of me hearing saying that these passages are strange or troubling. But today I think we have even stranger and even more troubling visions. In the second and third plagues that we hear about today, these things seem to hit the innocent, animals and nature in general, those that, that don't sin because they can't and yet seem somehow to be affected negatively by our actions and by God's response to them. But then in the fourth and fifth plagues, I think we have a clue. In both of those cases, people are described as suffering because they would not repent they would not give glory to God. They would not live as God intends. That seems to open a door for you and for me that, that in fact, there is a way to avoid some of these, these struggles and hardships of life, and that is by living righteous lives as best we can, by giving glory to God for all that we have and all that we are, for remembering that everything we have is a gift from God and so whatever may happen to it, however we may dispose of it, whatever it may mean to us at any particular time and how that may change is a reflection of the gratitude we should be feeling to God for all that we have been given. Interestingly, this passage has the only mention of Armageddon. This is an image that, again, has been used again and again in art and by other authors down through the centuries to describe some sort of battle that happens between good and evil, 
or between one religion and another, or one empire and another. Interestingly, if you go back and read it, or go back and listen, there is no actual battle scene. All we hear is that the kings of the earth are supposed to be summoned to this place where a battle may or may not take place. So a lot has been read into this that isn't actually in the text. And then, most importantly, for my purposes today at least, Babylon reappears. This is a hint before chapters 17 and 18, which are kind of the heart of the message of economic critique that the writer of Revelation is making about the world that he sees around him. But before that, there are some symbolic meanings here I think we should think about and have in mind as we go on in the text. Uh, there's a mention of, of water and damage to nature in this passage. Water plainly is, is a necessity for life. Water is something that we all need and that those who lived in dry places in deserts would certainly have recognized as being a critical necessity. So when we're thinking about this idea that, that rivers turn to blood and oceans likewise and everything in them is killed, I don't know that that's necessarily the literal meaning that the writer even intended for us to see. Plainly, I think there is something in this about the power of God over everything, that there is nowhere that is beyond the reach of God's power. There is nothing, there is no situation so desperate, there is no life so desperate that God cannot transform it. Also, I think this is a reminder to us that we may have undue confidence in the things that we think of as being permanent. If the ocean can turn to blood and all the life in it can be killed, that's something that, that ought to make us stop and wonder, well, did we think that could never happen? And if something on that scale can happen, what might happen with things closer to home that we also think of as being unshakable, as being constants in our lives? How might the plan and power of God transform even those things that we feel are the ground that is firm under our own feet? As I said, with the unrepentant, we plainly should keep in mind that God desires that we live. God does not, the, does not desire the death of sinners, as it says in right one, but rather that we should live. And so through all of these images, through all of the death and destruction that comes in Revelation, we should remember that it is always God's desire that we should turn again and live. And then in the fact that Armageddon is only a hint, we can see something of the way that the, the affairs of the world tend to affect all of us. I don't know about you, but uh, when I wake up in the morning and, and look at my telephone for the first time of the day, there are all these headlines about terrible things that have happened in the world. And just reading the headlines is really pretty disturbing. It shakes you up first thing in the morning. I think there is something to be said here for the fact that the affairs of the world should distract us, but should not unduly trouble us. This image of the kings gathering at Armageddon is only a headline. It doesn't really tell us the whole story. We don't know how that story plays out, let alone how it ends. And so although it might be disquieting to us to imagine wars and rumors of wars, as the Bible says, we should remember that our comfort and our serenity are to be found in the presence of God and that the affairs of this world can never really shake that. And then to end, and as a lead into where we're going with all this, there is the idea that somehow stewardship of the world matters. Babylon is described here as having economic guilt. There is a clear indication that the writer of Revelation wants us to know that God's judgment of this world falls on us in part, perhaps in large part, by the ways that we use money, the way that we use our economic system, the way we use our commercial system to exploit and oppress other people. So that Babylon has some economic guilt will play out in much clearer ways in the future of what I have to say to you. But for now, and in this season, it's worth bearing in mind that 
our stewardship of the world, our stewardship of our own resources is intended to have consequences and will be judged by God as much as any of our other actions, any of our other choices. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,